Psalms 30, but I want you to do this before I read it. I want you to find two people you have not said good morning to and tell them good morning. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, in Jesus' name, I come to you and I thank you for this day. I thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for the laughter. I thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, that your spirit has been felt for the music and the song. Heavenly Father, Lord, but most of all, I thank you for Jesus. And that my name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And today, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, their name shall be made permanent in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, I invite you, Holy Spirit, to be in our midst. I thank you for those that have been able to visit with us today. Others, family members, that say able to come back and they've been absent for a while. So God, I just thank you. Lord, draw our hearts closer to you and draw us closer to one another. In Jesus' name, change us through your word. In that name, amen. You may be seated. What's been very neat to me is that over the past few weeks, especially since the new year, um, it seems that all the Sunday morning sermons, even on into the week, I can't say that every one of them Sunday night and Wednesday night, but the majority of them have weaved together. There's been a thread that's been common in all of them. From the first message of the new year to where we're standing out right now, I feel like God has really pushed upon us and, and asked us and tried to move us into a direction of reaching higher ground. To go into a greater level. To go into a place with our relationship with Christ and in our relationship with God the Father that we have never been before. And I believe that God wants to do that. There's others in this church that believes that. But the one thing that we know is true is that it's not going to be easy to get to that place. We have an enemy, the devil. And not only does he want to keep us from going to that level, he wants us to regress and he wants to take away our testimony. I heard this week, as the men did as well, that if you lose your testimony, if the devil steals your testimony, you will be a blessed individual if you ever see it restored. If you ever see it restored. That's how, that's how serious our testimony is as a Christian. That's how real it is. And if the devil, no matter who you are, whether you may be the lowest, you feel like you're the lowest in your own chapel, or whether all the way up to the deacons and myself, the testimony that you have is the greatest weapon that you have for the Lord Jesus Christ and against Satan himself. And there's been that. And if we're going to go to that level, if you're going to be closer to the Lord, you're not going to trip over it. You're not going to wake up one morning and say, I'm closer than I ever have been to God. And no, you're going to fight for it. You're going to give everything. You're going to sweat. You're going to cry. You're going to claw. You're going to do everything you can to gain that next level. And when you get there, you're going to say, it was worth it. You're going to say, and so with this church. But there's two things that I believe keep us from number one, reaching the next level, and number two, experiencing true joy. True joy as a believer. The first thing is, I believe, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. That many professed Christians today have something inside of them that they're holding against another person. Whether that person's asked forgiveness or has not asked for forgiveness, it is the duty and the privilege of a believer to forgive. And when you forgive, what you're saying is this. No longer has what you've done going to control the relationship that you and I have. And number two is this. We don't praise God properly. We don't praise Him. We don't know what it means to exalt Him and to lift Him up. See, many of us in this world we live in, we, and praise God, Jesus was our brother. Amen. He was in flesh, just like you and I. But what we've done is we've put Him on the same level. We sing songs like me and Jesus got a good thing going, or Jesus take the wheel, and those are good ideas. But He's still the Son of God. And when we praise Him, we extol Him, or we exalt Him, meaning we take Him from a common level and lift Him up to an uncommon level in our life. We see Him as not common. Matter of fact, He is not natural. He is uncommon. He is supernatural. And we're to lift Him up and to put Him in those places. And everything that He does for us is a way that we can take and lift Him up. Amen. But we've got to learn how to pray. Many of us, and it was said this week, that you will never get anything out of a rushed, quiet time. 
If you try to rush your prayer time and you try to rush your quiet time and basically you're doing it because it's a duty and you're not really trying to get anything out of it, guess what? You ain't going to get anything out of it. And the same thing is with our praise. That's why when we come to church on Sunday mornings, we can't rush our song service. We can't barrel through that. Why? Because that is the preparation. That is what's getting us ready. And, and that's why when you go into a time of praise, and there should be a time of praise, just like there's a time of Bible reading, a time of prayer, there should be a time of praise in your everyday life where all you do is lift God above the common and make the supernatural supernatural in your life. Wednesday night here, we had one of the sweetest gatherings that I can remember. I did not preach. And there were many here that night that were hurting into trying situations. But it was in the midst of that that we were able to have our sweetest service. But what made the time so special was that God was here in the presence of His people. And He was welcomed here by His people. That His people gave Him an invitation that was sent to Him through their praise. The focus was not on the things the individuals were going through, but on the God that was with them in the midst of those situations. The God that was allowing them to be in the midst of those situations. The God that was going to bring them out of those situations. And when we left, folks went out in the same conditions, but they left lighter. They left feeling better and a bit stronger than they came in. Nothing changed except that they had met with God. The awesome thing as individuals, we can experience that empowerment and that peace on a daily basis. And to find it, we have to get apart, away from some of the uh, things of this world, and experience one of the greatest privileges that you and I, boy, man, uh, girl, woman, anybody can ever experience, and that is true praise to God the Father in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Human nature is so fallen that no matter how blessed you and I may be, no matter how much we have been, get, been given, we still want more. Every time we think we're close to being satisfied, we lay hands on what we think would satisfy us, and we find that there is still a desire for more. The deep satisfaction we think we will receive or feel by attaining something or possessing something, it never lasts. So in our flesh, we naturally want more. We naturally got to get more. Uh, and, and, and that's where the faults are now. Also, if we want something or if we do get something good, many times we, we pat our own selves on the back for it. We say, look, that's what David is saying there in verse 6 where he says, and in my prosperity... I said, I said, I will not be moved. Look at me. I've made it so far that I don't have to worry about anything knocking me down. There's a place in each of our minds, most of us, that we say, if I can reach this point in my life, if I can reach this point in my bank account, if I can grab this, then I can live peaceably then and I won't have to worry anymore. Can I tell you that if anything other than Jesus Christ is if I can have this, You'll never be satisfied. You'll never experience peace. You'll never have satisfaction. And you'll never know what we're doing joy because you're always going to be reaching for something greater. Praise God, we're working in about why not reach every day more for Jesus than anything else in this world. Listen to Psalms chapter 150. Uh, this is the last Psalms in the book of Psalms. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty act. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him for the sound of His trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and heart. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him with the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Everything in this world has been commanded by its Creator. If it draws breath in, when it exhales out, exhales that breath, it should be in the exaltation and uplifting of
of its creator. That's who is the, God has declared to praise everything that lives. And this especially goes for man. Man has been made in the image of God. We have been made to have a relationship with God. The first man, Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the garden. If you have ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, can I tell you there's a void in your life today? There's something missing? You're hungering for something. You're working for something. A bigger house, a finer home, a better relationship with your wife, a better relationship with your husband, better money. Maybe you're trying to find it in alcohol, drugs, or illicit relationships. But there's a void and you're doing what you can to fill that void. You see, the reason that void is there is because you have not attained to what you were created to lay hold of. And that was knowing God through His Son, Jesus Christ. You were created to have a relationship with God. But can I tell you this, Christian? You that have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved, if you are not setting aside every day a place where you praise God, a place where you worship God, a place where you exalt Him in your life, I bet you right now there's a void in your life too. There's an emptiness in your life. You don't have that joy. You think about this sometimes. I thought that there would be more to it than this. I thought there would be a better relationship. I thought I would have better joy. I thought I would have better peace. You know what the problem is? Not only were you created to have a relationship with God, but you were created to be a vessel that praised God, that exalted Him. You were saved by His grace and His glory to be a vessel that Reveal His grace and His glory to everyone else around you. He gave you a new life. You were dead in your trespasses and sin and raised you up. I don't know about you, but you can look at my driver's license picture from when I got saved. I don't look at the same man. There's more of me I was informed today than there was of that man. But I also look different in my place. You know why? Because in my character and in my nature, He uses me as His glory. But I'm going to tell you this. We... When you proclaim Christ as your Savior, and when you declare the goodness, and when you give the praise to Him, there's something that happens, and you get strengthened, and you find joy, and you find peace in that life, because you were created to do that. And when a vessel is used properly, then the value is found. What good is a hammer as a saw? It's never going to work. And it's never going to have any value as a saw. But man, if you want to whack something, or if you want to pull a nail, you get that hammer. And all the value you put into that thing, it will be revealed in it. And when you praise God, and you explain His value to the world that's around you, then your true value is experienced. You're fulfilled. What good is having a 32-ounce cup if you're only going to put 20 ounces in it? Right? Ask Randall Gunner. He'll tell you about those big old cups. And that's the way you are today. God has saved you to fill you with joy, with, with power, with strength. And, and the way you be filled is to unfill yourself of the knowledge that you have of Christ so that He'll just fill it in. To declare His praise. Do we truly practice praise on a daily basis? The word praise renders an idea of this. That a person that is a close, a person that is in a close and favored relationship with God declares His great blessings and benefits in their attitude, actions, and outward expressions. How do they do that? They do it with words, with songs, with bodily actions, they acknowledge and give thanks for His grace, goodness, and mercy. I'm going to tell you this, there was not a greater writer of praise, a greater writer of songs that glorified God than King David himself. And you know what it tells us? You read in this book and probably of Psalms, 75% of those were wrote by David himself and the Israelites sang them and probably still sing them right now. It tells us that when he brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, he danced. He was a man of praise. 
He was a man after God's own heart. Meaning what? His heart was in line with God's heart and that God was happy that he was a man who he lifted him up and gave praise to his holy name. And God wants you to be that type of person today. That acknowledges him. Not only were you created to praise, but you were given a life to be an example of His goodness and reflection of His glory. If praise is not consistent and important in your life, then bottom line, you are unfulfilled as a Christian. If praise is not a priority, and praise is not a practice in your life, then as a believer, as a Christian, you are unfulfilled. There is an emptiness in you as we speak. Psalms 22, verse 3, listen to what it says. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praise of Israel. That's the closest verse you'll ever find in the Bible to the saying that we use and many believe is in the Bible that God inhabits the praise of His people. That's the closest thing you'll find to it. But you know what? Spiritually, I'm an Israelite. It says not those of the circumcised, but those that are of a circumcised heart. Are it you? What's that saying? It's saying that when you focus on praise, when you make praise a priority, when you who are in a close relationship with God, when you lift up who He is and what He's done in your life through songs, through actions, and through words, then His presence is more consistent in your life. More consistent in your life. And praise does not come naturally. Can I get an amen on that? Most of you today don't want to throw up your hand up. You're intimidated. Me and, me and Brother Joey learned about all different kinds of how to worship the Lord. This is talking to TV. This is talking to widescreen. This is turning on the light bulb. This is, well, I mean, but this is touchdown. That's when you really get excited about it. You throw up a touchdown. You see, there's all kinds of ways to pray. But many of us don't feel comfortable doing it. We go by a feeling when we want to praise instead of what we've been told to do, what we've been commanded to do. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Let everything that has breath lift up in actions and attitude their Creator. Matter of fact, and those of us that are in a fallen nature, sinners, every human being, my mind and my flesh not only does praise not come easy, my mind and my flesh is totally against praise. Not only does it not want to praise and acknowledge what good things God has done in my life, but it wants to acknowledge the negative things that are going on in my life. See, along with the spiritual battles and the hardship, praise consistently falls by the wayside for things like this. Instead of saying, praise God, that I'm alive and well today. Go say something about this. I don't understand why this is happening to me. I'm a pretty good person. I'll try to honor God in what I do, right? If I had this, I'd be satisfied. Lord, you know. You know my and you say, Lord, if, if you give us the desires of your heart, I don't understand why you're not giving me this. Nobody understands. I don't even know if you understand, Lord. Life just ain't fair. It's not fair. And every bit of that is true. Every bit of what I just said is true. King David was a man after God's own heart. The author of so many praises. He had made praise important in his life, but there come a point in his life where he didn't. He got caught up in his own popularity. He began to take credit for God's blessings. He got upset at God's correction. He questioned why certain things were happening to him. If you don't believe me, go read about it. Yet once his mind became clear and his heart got right once again, praise again became a priority in his life. And today, if you want to experience the joy that cannot be explained, if you want that fulfillment that Paul and Silas had in the midst of a dark dungeon, it's going to be because you make praise a priority in your life. And this praise, the one that we read right here in the book of Psalms, 
then this praise is a dedication for David's personal home. He is giving his home over to the Lord. He has been blessed, and he, but he's been through some hard times. And there are some aspects of this praise. I believe that if we put them in action on our everyday life, and when I say we, I mean me, because I struggle with praise. Praise does not come easy to me. It doesn't. It's having a part of time where all I'm going to do is lift up who he is. That's all I'm going to do. For ten minutes, that's all I'm going to do. I need to put these in practice and you need to put these in practice and it will help you, it will help your home and it will help Yomans Chapel Baptist Church become a place where praise is practiced and then if that has happened, then the presence of God will surely be here. Not because we make Him come but because He has promised to come where the people are praising Him, He'll be in their midst. Notice the first one. It's the first five letters, six letters. I will extol thee, O Lord. The word extol there means to raise up or elevate, to take from a lower level and to put up on a higher level. But the neat thing about this, I will extol thee, is not the words I will extol, it's the verb phrase that it's in. You're saying, what? Why are you bringing up a verb phrase? Well, see, we've got a couple different kind of verb phrases we're used to. You know, it had happened, it will happen, or it's happening right now, or it had happened right now. You know what I mean? Past, present, and future. But this one's a little bit different. We in the English do not have a verb phrase to go along with this. This is strictly Jewish type. And I, I can't really explain it to you without giving you an illustration. You see this paper right here. I, wanna, I want this paper to fit in my pocket. Alright? But what happens? This paper just not magically go from being this way to being this way, right? It takes the time of preparation. This is what he says. When he says, I will extol thee, it's the idea of unfolding or folding something, meaning that I'm going to be in a process. I'm starting something. I'm going to lift you up, and right now I'm lifting you up. I may not leave me lifting you up right now, but I'm going to be lifting you up in a minute. The idea is this. You do not just jump into praise like we said. Most of us do not, most of the time, we do not feel like praising God. That's why we don't praise God. We never finish praising God because we never start praising the God. Because we have to enter into a process of praise. Amen. I want you to think about when we stand up in here and we have prayer, praise and testimony time. If one person will stand up, usually I can guarantee you at least three is going to testify. You know why? Because the process started. We didn't wait for the paper just to end up from being uh, a square piece of paper to be in a folded piece of paper. No, we begin the action. Folks, you're never going to be a person who practices praise unless you start it. There's a warm-up time. You've got to get it going. You've got, hey, you know what? You'll never up, end up doing the touchdown until you end up raising it up like this. You'll never get both hands up unless you get one hand up. Amen? And that's the way it is. Many of us, especially as Baptists, we never start praising God. See, that's the first point. If we're going to practice praise, we've got to be willing to prepare for praise. We've got to be willing to prepare for praise. Look at this. Um, this like I said, this is not, this is about, uh, think about a map. If your wife tells you she wants you to get out the map and look at the map. And she's saying, which way should I go? What do you say? Wait till I get it unfolded. Right? Wait till I get it out there properly. Why? Or maybe husband doesn't, because it takes you a little time to get where you can define where you're going. And that's the same picture here. Um, believers that are trapped in this sinful flesh, praise does not come natural. We do, matter of fact, what we do is we do what makes us feel good. We do what we want. If we're going to put some praise, we're going to pat ourselves on the back to make it feel good. Usually, uh, a self-pat on the back is about all the praise that we make a, a, a point in our life to do. But listen, in John 4, 24, it says this, God is the Spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Folks, there needs to be a time apart in your day. Don't rush it. Where you say, I'm fixing to praise God. Maybe it's on your car ride to work. 
But when you get in that car, you say right now, flesh, you don't like it. You go to your prayer closet and you say, flesh, you may not like it. But right now, I'm about to praise God. Amen. When's the last time you just told the world, I'm just to praise God? When you told your flesh, flesh, we will praise God. When you told the demons and the things that surround us on a daily basis, I'm going to praise God. And the more you praise God, the more your flesh is going to be willing to get in on it. You don't just jump up, praising hands and shouting out and dancing them to out. No, it becomes. Think about your uh, car when you crank it up. A wise man lets his cars and all the stuff inside of it start pumping up and getting a little warm before it burns out in 60 miles an hour. What well, when you cut your heater on and you smell that funny smell, it ain't immediately, uh, uh, immediately heat coming out of the bin, is it? Why? Why? It's a process. Even a computer. When you cut on a computer, you have to wait a little while. Why? Because it has to a process. You just got to go through until it's ready. You need to have a process to where you enter into praise. Now sometimes, man, we come in here and the Spirit falls down and we're just ready to go and it's easy to pray. But on a daily basis outside the walls of this church, it doesn't come naturally. First thing you need to do if you're going to praise the Lord is you need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and lead you in that praise. You need to say something like this. Dear Holy Spirit, I recognize that in my flesh I cannot exalt my Creator in the way that I should. So right now I ask you to come and take control of my mind, take control of my mouth, and praise God, take control of my flesh, and I'm going to praise my God the way He has created me to praise my God. Amen. That gets me excited just to say that out loud. Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Can I tell you this? When's the last time you've wanted to praise God? Because the Spirit that lives within you will want to praise God. Your flesh may not want to, but there'll be something inside of you that desires to praise God. After you ask the Holy Spirit to come into your midst, then you do this. Holy Spirit, reveal to me the sin that I may not realize in my life. You see, God will not come into the presence of sin. And it tells us that if there's true praise, Psalms 22 says that if there's true praise, then God will inhabit the praise of, of Israel. Don't you want God to meet with you on a daily basis? Don't you want to be in His presence like we were Wednesday night and leave out of that closet lighter than you were when you went in? But then you've got to be willing to get right with your sins. God wants to forgive your sins. Matter of fact, He's already made provisions to forgive your sins. If you just lay them out there. Holy Spirit, come take control of this time because I want to praise my God. Father, reveal to me my sins because I want to praise my God. And then maybe admit this. To be honest with you, Lord, I really don't feel like being in here in the flesh. Brian, how dare you say that to God? He already knows it. We go around here and act so holier than thou. We act like we've got it all together. When God already knows that our desire in the flesh is not, we'd rather be out there throwing a football. We'd rather be out there shooting a bow and arrow. But our spirit has let us know we need to be in a time of praise. And you know what he'll do then? He'll start dealing with the flesh. See, His Spirit is stronger than that flesh. There's a time of preparation if you really want to truly praise God. You notice how our song services lots of times too. They just, the, it sounds better the more we, the further we go. You know why? Because we get warmed up a little bit. Get moved up a little bit. Acknowledge I need your spirit. Acknowledge the fact that the sin in my life and I need to get it out and admit to the fact that there... There's a part of me that just does not want to be here right now. Don't play games. Be real in the presence of God. He knows your heart. And He has the ability to change your heart. Just be real. And in doing this, the preparing to lift up the name which is above every name, 
You will equip, the Spirit will equip you to exalt Jesus above your flesh, your feelings, and your faithfulness. Praise God. That's what will happen. But you need to prepare to praise God if we're going to be a people who practices true praise. The next thing is, is we've got to recognize that praise is to be practical. Praise is to be practical. Look there in verses uh, 1 through 3. It says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought me my soul up from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. You know, many times when we say we're going to pray something, if we're going to stand up in church and we're going to tell what God has done for us, it's got to be something that's almost supernatural. Pray to God I was $7,000 in debt and all of a sudden I cracked my egg in the morning and $7,000 fell out of that egg. And praise God, we've got a God who's alive and waiting. Amen. And that would be amazing. And I pray tomorrow morning, I crack an egg, and there's seven thousand dollars in that egg. And I will post it on Facebook and probably give you a few, a few phone calls saying, "My gosh, there he is, seven thousand dollars in an egg." He did it with a fish. He did it with a fish. But I want you to notice the simplicity to which David gives God praise for. It's the simple things, the little things. Look what he said. Number one, he says. Over my foes. Praise God, you gave me victory over my enemy. Praise God, in verse 2, he's basically saying, you heard my prayer, and you gave me physical help. And in the third verse, he says, you gave me victory over the grave. Nothing, nothing outward supernatural there. Nothing that's going to make you go, oh, wow. Nothing that's just going to make you say, fall down on your knees. But what he's saying is it meant something to him. And he wanted to let God know that it meant something to him. Look, the first thing is victory over his enemy. He's talking about Saul here. He's at that place and that point in his life where Saul was out to kill him. He had repeatedly tried to take every uh, David's life. Everyone in here today has an enemy just like David and Saul were enemies. And that is Satan. Every day, whether you're saved or you're not saved, the devil is out to destroy you. His goal is told over there in John chapter 10, verse 10. But the enemy is come, the thief is come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You look up the word destroy there, it means to annihilate you, to wipe you from existence. There will be no remembrance of you if he had a desire. And see, whether it be drugs, alcohol, bad relationships, or the world in general, Every day, he's using those things as the prince and the paladins of this world. And he has power and authority in this world. Because God's allowed. We gave it to him in the garden. Adam did. And he's using these things trying to kill you. And every day that you wake up in the morning is a testimony that the favor of God has been on your life. And the devil could not conquer your physical life. Every morning you wake up, you can be able to say, Thank you, God. Drugs has not took my life. Thank you, God. Alcohol has not took my life. Thank you, God. That relationship didn't take my life. Thank you, God. Nothing in this world has took my life. And i got a brand new day to live it for you. That's the things we give God praise for. Amen. That's the thing. See, we want to make it these big things. But it's the little things in life that makes life. And it's the little things that we acknowledge about. Praise God, I'm alive. I put things in my body for the living that should have took me out, but it didn't. Amen. And I did damage that will affect me from years to come. And every day, those drugs and those alcohols and those things, they still didn't get me. Amen. And I can give God praise for that. And you can too. And you should too. Amen. Thank you, God, for holding back my enemy. He has no power over me. And that's what you can say every morning when you wake up. Thank you, God, that you're bigger than my enemy. And you have defeated my enemy. You don't have to be the big deal. I got in the wreck in the wreck car, rolled over 14 times, and it was flat, and nobody should have thought I'd live. But I mean, we'll give God praise for that, won't we? But praise God, can I tell you, there's a semi named Satan that's wanting to flatten you every day. And when you get out of it and you get out of bed every morning and you stretch and your back pops, that's the evidence that the favor of God has been upon you. 
I'm popping my back for your glory, Lord. That's what you made me, praise God. Praise God. Praise is to be practical. Look, the next one is an answer prayer. I want you to consider what they prayed for back then. Even in the Lord's Prayer, what does it tell us to pray for? And give us this day our what? I ain't probably a person in this place got to worry about where the next man comes from. And thus, because we don't have to worry about where it comes from, we ain't ask God to provide it. Right? But praise God, I got food waiting on me. I get to eat very well, Sister Dandra. <laughs> Thank God. I got food going to waste. Sister Ann put something on Facebook the other day. Since name's Christian, she should stop doing it. You know, we need to ask, stop asking God for provisions until we've used what He already provided. Mm -hmm. See, that's something to give praise God for. I ain't even asked you for it. It's already there. You see how simple we pass over the simple things to praise God for and don't even give Him a thought about it. Practical praise will bring in you into a greater relationship with God. I promise. I promise. Thank Him that you woke up. Thank Him that you got food to eat. Thank Him that you got clothes on your back and all those things. Thank Him I got a job, praise God. I got a car, praise God. I got a church, praise God. I got a spouse, praise God. Most people in the world, we say, well, I don't like my car. I don't like my job. I don't like my church and I don't like my spouse. You know, most people in the world would accept your car and accept your job and accept your church and give back your spouse. <laughs> no. They would be thankful for it. Thankful for it. Just give me one day to drive the Pinto. <laughs> give me one day not having to walk. Give me one day where I can earn a hundred dollars in a day instead of twenty. Give me that one day, and they would thank God for it. You see, it's all how we look at it. It's going to be hard, no question. Life is hard. We've already talked about. There's questions there, and all these things, and why God. And yes, this there, and we can get caught up in those things, but we can also get caught up in the praise. Amen. And we should focus on those praise. Make your praise practical. The answer is prayers. I promise you right now. You think about it. There's a prayer in your life that's been answered this week, or maybe it's been answered, and you ain't even have to ask for it. That's the reason to get prayer. And look, the next thing is physical health. And I really had to stop and think about this one. Because I know that there are people in here that's dealing with some major physical situations. Major physical situations. And, and another thing I had to consider is that I am not you. But, even those that are dealing with major physical situations, there are people in the world that will trade positions with you right now to experience the blessed health that you do have. I couldn't help but think about maybe it hurts when you take a step. But what about the paralyzed person that will never take a step again? Never be able to take a step again. Maybe what about those that have been cast into homes and facilities and forgotten by their families? They would trade places just to be able to feel the loving touch or the phone call that you receive from family members. What about those that will never speak another word due to a stroke or a brain aneurysm? Never be able to tell their loved ones, I love you. You see, there's many levels of health. I understand that. But no matter what level you're at right now, more than likely there is somebody that would be willing 
to be in that situation if but for a moment. If but for a moment. And when I was thinking about that, those that may have lost their speech, probably some of them would, would want to say, if only one more day, I could say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Just one more time. Let me declare how good God has been to me. Folks, have we become that spoiled in America that we take for granted the simple things but we don't have to stay there. We can become a people who practice praise. If we were prepared for praise and we were recognized that prayer should be and praise should be practical and then we need to recognize that our praise is going to be progressive. It's going to get bigger. Look there in verses 4 and 5. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give remembrance at, at the, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. For His anger endureth but for a moment, and His favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Notice what He's doing. He's beginning to praise God, and now He's saying, Hey, get in here with me and praise God. When you think about these things, when you think about the victories that we have. When you think about all these other things, and there's another reason to praise, victory over the grave. I can go back to that one, but we're going to push on. When he thinks about these things, it makes him want to get other people. He encourages them to come along beside him. And I noticed that while I was studying this, and it's true in real life, that when we take time to prepare for praise, and we make our praise practical, and the Spirit comes and makes us consider the simple things and the blessings that we experience every day, unnoticed by men, you desire for other people to recognize it. Don't they see how blessed they are? Don't they recognize how blessed they are? We all in here this morning, if nothing else, can say, praise God. If we've truly been it in our hearts, can stand up and say, I thank God that I'm alive today. Man, what would God do with that right there? What would they, and that's what He's wanting to do. He's wanting to call these people because they would grasp the truth. And I want you to grasp this truth today, Christians. No matter how bad it gets and how rough you got it right now, you ain't going to hell, praise God. If nothing else, man, when the bills come in the mail and you look at them, put some on the mirror or on the refrigerator, when you pick your head up and say, but you ain't going to hell, you can say, praise God. Whoa, hallelujah. This might be bad, but I ain't going to hell. It looks up and says, hey, um, you got a speeding ticket the other day because you was going 73 in a 55 and you didn't have a tag on it. Oh, I ain't going to hell. Praise God. That's on the sign there. You see, people need to hear you praise. It's contagious. Like I said before, one person stands up, we'll sit here in silence for about 20 seconds. Anybody got a word of praise and worship today? Well, Brother Brian, I, and before that person's done, boom, there goes another one over there. And then it starts snowballing, and I don't even get to preach. Why? Because somebody prepared and the others recognize they got things to praise God for. And they begin to praise God. Snowballs. You can praise God and relieve your brother and sister of burden by leading them into praise. You know that? You can do that. See, your praise is progressive. It grows. You'll start out praising this week for 10 minutes. And I promise you, if you practice it a month, by the end, by the fourth week, you'll at least be up to 15 to 20 minutes. I ain't no doubt in my mind. If you won't rush it, then you'll make the praise serious in your life. You'll sit outside. You'll leave from your house to go to work. And when you get to work, you'll sit there and you'll sit in the car for a few more minutes to finish up. I won't. And that's what God has put on my heart. I, I feel like this year God's wanted me to preach practical messages. Messages that you can apply when you leave this place. And this is one. The next one is, the second to the last one is, is that praise is for predicaments and punishment too. It's not just for the good times. It's for when God's giving you a spanking 
And we knew in trying and difficult times too. Look what he says in verses 6 to 10. And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. And I cried, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made my supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down in the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? O hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Now remember, we have... Prepared to praise. We're making our praise practical or for the simple things. We're recognizing that if we get into true praise, then it's going to progress, it's going to fill up our lives, and it's going to touch other people's lives when we exalt Christ to where He's supposed to be. But then we've also got to remember that we're to praise Him when it's difficult, and even when we're being punishment, we're to be thankful for those things too. Notice David says, In my prosperity. The word prosperity there means that he felt secure. When he felt secure, when he had a lot of stuff and everything was going good in his life, he made this statement, Lord, I'm going to be faithful. And I'll be unwavering and unshakable. <coughs> but, when things got difficult, when things got rough, he began to question God. He began to not write as many songs of praise. I'm the anointed king. Why would this happen to me? Just why I saw him off the face of the earth and put me up there. You see, many of us, we do the same thing. That's the thing about David. David was a man after God's own heart. He did things that pleased God, but David was a man. And that means he did things like us, but it also means that you can be a person after God's own heart and can be called a friend of God. And because of all that, because in his prosperity he got a little prideful, started patting his own self on the back and all those things, it says there that God hid his face from him. Meaning that he removed his hand of favor. He removed his hand of blessing. He, God allowed things to get hard in his man's life. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 7 it says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as a son. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not. I did get a ticket the other day. 73 and 55. And I didn't have a tag on. And I was mad about it. And when the cop was walking away, I felt the Lord move upon me to say thank you. Why well, say thank you to that rascal? Because he was doing his job. And if he pulled me over, then probably he was going to pull over a drunk driver, other speakers, and other people that's being reckless. You see, everybody out there on the road should have been fearful of me in that moment because I was speaking. And he says, no, I love my other constituents. I'm not going to let you harm them. Which one's better? Six licks to the hiney or an electric chair? Exactly. You see, that's what God's doing. To his children. He'll put six legs on us to keep us from the flames of hell any day. Amen? Amen. And that's what, and we can say, praise you God for what I'm going through. Have I been wrong? Have I been out of will? I don't know, but I'm trying to see, Lord, show me. But even if it's not, even if the God is not uh, preparing you or punishing you, and you're just going through a difficult time, you still ought to praise God. God put this on my heart. Let me ask you this. If I cannot praise God in this tough time, then how authentic and real is my praise in the good times? How real is it? If I can't praise Him when things ain't good, then how valuable is my praise when it is good? You see, because if we change it, then we're placing uh, conditions on God. We say something like this. Uh, if I'm happy, then God is good, He is fair, He is right, He deserves my praise and my devotion and my service. As long as everything's the way that I want it to be. But, if everything ain't the way that I want it to be, if I'm not happy and things ain't the way I want it, then somehow God is no longer fair, He's no longer uh, right, and He's not deserving of my praise, devotion, or service. You see, we place it on the situation. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Life is hard. 
Every man that I was with on that ship this week confirmed it in one way or another. Then you know what? Before the Lord comes, as we get closer, it's going to be getting harder and harder. But in the midst of that, you still got a God who is bigger than your enemy. Amen? And He's going to win. And you're going to win in Jesus' name. And David realizes this. David recognizes that the things that have happened around him shouldn't move on what he's done or the way he's going to live for the Lord. Notice what he said. He says, Shall the dust praise thee? What are you and I made out of? Of the dust of the earth. The only difference that is between me and you and dirt is that God has formed us and breathed the Spirit into us. And if we, and for what purpose? To have a relationship with Him and to sing His praises. If we're not going to do prayer His praises, then why shouldn't we be dirt? Right? He'll just take some more dirt, bring life in it, and make it a praise. David recognized that. He's saying, God, return back to me, and I promise you, I'm going to be better than dirt. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to make you number one in my life. And anybody who's around me, they're going to hear the praise that I have for you. You see, he got prepared to praise. He made his praise practical. He recognized that his praise was going to be progressive. He was able to praise God in the midst of punishment and predicaments. And the last thing is, he experiences what it's like to have true praise. Notice these last two verses, and this is where I want to get, man. This, I just want the Spirit of God to come so strong down here one day on us and in my prayer time. Man, if I told you what went on in my prayer time sometimes, you would run me off as a pastor of a Baptist church. You would. Because the Spirit comes in, and when He takes hold, man, He does what He wants to do. Look what He says. I've been turned four or five pages. Verse 11. Thou hast turned me from what? Mourning to dancing. Thou hast put off my sad clothes and girded me with gladness. Look what he's saying there. He's saying, man, I was depressed and, and crying and gray, but now with my head down crying, but now I'm up and I'm dancing, man. My body is, is moving. He says, I was in gray clothes, gray and yellow and all that, but now I'm in gladness. What colors would you ascribe to gladness? When I say the word glad, what word pops to your mind? Yellow, that's exactly that. Or a bright green or, or something like that pops to my mind. You know why? Because there's a bright, there's a vibrant about it. And that's what happens right there. If you're down today, take some time, get alone and praise God and, and see what happens. See what happens. He goes on to say this. He says, to the end that my glory may praise Amen. This is going to be the purpose. Why did all this happen? Why did you raise me up? Because my strength, that's what the word glory there, my power or my strength will be used. What? To fight these other battles? To want to figure out why this is happening? No, I'm going to do it for the glory of thy name. To praise you, to exalt you, to lift you up. Nehemiah verse 8. Chapter 8, verse 10. For this, is, uh, this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Can I tell you what makes ha God happy today? When you declare how good He's been to you. And you know what? When God gets happy, you're going to get strong. When His joy comes down, when He fills you with His presence, and He fills you with His joy, you're going to become physically and spiritually strong. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Practical praise today. It ain't got to be a big deal. You ain't got to make a big commotion about it. But you truly, truly need it in your life. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Really and truly, you have nothing today to be happy about. You've got some things that are fleeting in your life, but when you die, they're all going to pass away. But if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as His Spirit is moving upon you right now, you'll have something to celebrate for the rest of eternity. Others in here today, your focus has been a little bit off. And there are situations in your life that probably ain't fair. They're not fair. But God is still good. He's still worthy of your praise. 
And I believe if you'll praise Him in these little things, number one, you're going to find strength to make it through the unfairness. And number two, you might just see the unfairness change as you recognize the goodness that's already been. I don't know where you're at today, but I'm going to ask the song leader to come, the piano player or, or whoever we've got this morning to come. And I'm going to open up the altar to you, and I'm going to invite you to come and just praise. Just come down here. Though your body may not feel like it, tell it, body, I'm going to praise my God. I'm going to bow down to the one who created me. Maybe you need to join you on this chapel. That might be a part of your praise. I want to let God know how good He's been to me by being obedient as He calls me to be a member here. Rededication, whatever. But it's up to you as we stand.